Good evening, everyone. My name is Tyler Glass, and I'm a Kevin V. Harrington Student Ambassador. And on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics here at St. Anselm College, I'd like to welcome you and thank you all for joining us for this evening's event. Uh, the Missions Institute is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and to strengthen democracy. The Institute's nonpartisan and does not endorse or support any political issues or candidates. And just before we begin this evening's program, I would like to remind you to turn off any cell phones or other electronic devices that could make noise. Let's get that ant out of there. Oh, well, there goes my speaking career. So, tonight's speaker, Con Scott Conroy, is the author of Vote First or Die. And he spent more time in New Hampshire than any other state over the course of covering three presidential campaign cycles. And he was doing that while he was a reporter for the Huffington Post, Real Clear Politics, and CBS News. He's the co-creator and executive producer of Embeds on Verizon's Go90 platform. He's also the co-author of the Sarah Palin biography, Sarah from Alaska, and he's created and directed New Hampshire, a seven-part Huffington Post original documentary series about the life on 2016 campaign trails for the first in the nation primary state. Tonight, Mr. Conroy will be joining us for a discussion entitled, just as the book, Vote for Die," and he's going to talk about what happened specifically in 2016 and what New Hampshire has to do to make sure that it makes its case heading into the 2020 cycle when the state's likely to find its special status coming under attack like never before. And then following Mr. Conroy's remarks, we will have a brief question and answer period. And during that time, you can line up behind the standing microphones, which are on either side, uh, to ask your question. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Scott Conroy. All right, well thanks so much, Tyler. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, I wanted to make sure to thank Neil, Levesque, and Ann. Um, and we have uh, Secretary of State Gardner hanging out in the back there, and I wanted to make sure to thank him too. Um, I have sat through a lot of speeches here, uh, like you're all sitting through mine right now, and I never expected to be up here uh, before, but um, unlike um, a lot of the, the people that will be uh, taking this podium uh, in the next few months and, and next couple of years. I promise you I am not running for president in 2020 and also unlike a lot of them when, when I tell you that I really mean it so um, I won't be signing any eggs today but it's really great to, to be here uh, at the Institute a place that really you know is the heart and soul of the, of the New Hampshire primary. Um, so it was about actually the three years ago um, and I think I probably spoken to Jim Merrill about it uh, at the time where I kind of had the idea initially to write a book uh, about the primary. Um, I'd already covered two as a reporter um, by that point, and I knew that there had been books about the, the history of the primary uh, itself that were fairly comprehensive, um, and there had also been several campaign books about individual um, primary campaign. So I wanted to, to sort of combine those two ideas. And when I initially um, talked about the idea for the book with my publisher, Public Affairs, um, they wanted me to, to think of it really as a form of travel writing, um, which is not something that I had ever done before. Um, but it was something that I was really interested in doing. It was a new, um, a, a new style for me. Um, and, and that's kind of how the book um, ended up uh, working out. It's, it's a, it's a first-person narrative account of um, just really being in New Hampshire and taking in the sights and sounds and meeting all the people uh, along the way that make the primary what it is. Um, but I also, you know, I spoke to a couple dozen uh, people who had been involved in the primary for the last 45 years or so. Um, and just wanted to get some of their stories of their favorite moments from primaries past, um, moments that stuck, that really stood out in their minds, whether they were just interesting or funny or revealing of the primary in some way. Um, 
So I, you know, I think all of the, the big stories, most of us who follow the primary pretty closely have, have heard before, and, and some of those, uh, some of those are in there. Um, but I also wanted to um, go a little bit deeper and you know create kind of a hodgepodge um, of, of the, again the sights and sounds of the primary. So this is really kind of my my personal account. It's not meant to be you know a textbook of the New Hampshire primary, but. Hopefully it's kind of a light and breezy uh, read that won't, won't be too much of a heavy, heavy lift um, and you'll maybe learn something along the way too. Um, and I pointed out at the beginning that I, I started this book uh, three years ago because um, you know, in publishing you, <laughs> you submit your, uh, your manuscript, you go through a couple drafts with the editor uh, and then when you're, you're finished and it's been copy edited, you hand it off and it takes another six months or so for them to you know finally put the thing together and get it published so um you know it it it, it was kind of interesting for me when this book came out last week because um i felt like in sort of rereading it um some of the stories from even the 2016 campaign feel like 100 years ago now i mean we're just the state that we are in as a country our politics have changed an incredible amount um just in the last year and in particularly um, the last, you know, two years since um, since the primary campaign of 2016 really got underway, and and I, I don't think you can overstate how monumental uh, the 2016 race was in shaping the course of our country, um, and how integral it all New Hampshire was to it all. I mean, I covered the 2008 campaign was my first um, as a reporter, and uh, I covered Mitt Romney's first campaign, and then Sarah Palin. Um, and I remember thinking at the time that this is definitely the most insane election we will ever have. Like, this is just crazy. Nothing will ever top this. I can retire now <laughs> at the age of 25, you know. Um, but uh, it, it, it turned out that things would get even more ridiculous and interesting um, in, in 2016. So my approach basically, you know, when I, when I first started compiling research, I, I, I met with people like Jim and and others that had been around the primary for, for a long time and, and I just wanted to get their stories and I conducted my research um, you know, through secondary sources and primary sources. But then you know, very quickly I wanted to just be here as, mu as much as I could and, and just I, I really don't think there's any substitute as a reporter or as an author um, for being on the ground and, and picking up those sights and sounds that I was talking about earlier. And, you know, while I can't claim to have predicted back then that Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders were going to win the 2016 New Hampshire primary, in fact, I probably would have laughed a little bit as I just did right now at that idea because it seemed so absurd at the time. You, you could tell pretty early on, and I think, you know, a lot of us who were around the state um, during that time could, could really pick up on the fact that there was something very different in the air than, than what, what we traditionally see uh, in a presidential race. And, it does kind of continue to shock me that the rest of the country uh, was frankly very, um, uh, very behind in, in picking up on that. Um, and even, even after you know Bernie uh, and, and Trump won here, you know, for a long time the, the narrative didn't really fully coalesce around the idea that this was a very unusual election and that the grassroots of both parties were really rising up in a way um, that they they never had. Uh, at least in, in quite some time uh, before. So I think, you know, New Hampshire really, in my mind, the, the voters here um, was trying to send a, a very clear message to the rest of the country in 2016. Uh, and ultimately that, that message was received, <laughs> but um, I, I think it was, it was not received as, as quickly um, as it should have been. And uh, that's really a testament to the voters here. I mean, uh, you can just, I remember my, my very first day, uh, I grew up in Massachusetts and I had family uh, in New Hampshire, my Uncle Bob's here tonight, Bedford resident. Um, so I've been coming to New Hampshire my whole life, but I never spent a lot of time you know, on, on the campaign trail. And my first event uh, as a reporter was in 2007, I think it was the, the Milford Labor Day Parade. Um, and just covering Mitt Romney and being around town halls for the first time on that day, you really could pick up this idea that there is something different in the air here. Um, and I think, you know, I, I love Iowa. I've spent a lot of time in Iowa. Uh, nothing against Iowa, as people like to say here. Um, but it's just not quite the same. Um, you know, 
Iowa, uh, you know, has, has, has gone first. The Caucasus have gone first since 76. But I think it's a testament to New Hampshire that consistently, and again in 2016, uh, higher turnout here in a, in a primary caucus than any other state in the country. Um, I think Iowa record turnout for the caucuses is something like 19% of, of, of <laughs> registered voters in the state. And that's not something that gets talked about a lot, but it's, it's, it's the truth. And, you know, partially it's because the, the caucuses are such an absurd process, uh, particularly on the Democratic side. You know, we have to physically line up in, in, in separate corners of the room and cajole people um, to, to come and support your candidate if they don't um, reach a, a viability threshold. And I think there's something nice about the fact that here in New Hampshire, you just go and you vote, you leave, and that's it. You know, there's no absentee voting. Um, you just got to show up on primary day and, and do your duty, and people have been doing that. Um, for, for a very long time and it's you know it, it's something that I think is is uh, quaint is a word that, that gets used a lot when you talk about the New Hampshire primary um, but to me it's you know it's it's appealingly uh, quaint and I think um, it says something about the state that uh, you know 400 state reps more than any other state if you extrapolated that to the population of California uh, you would have something like 12,000 and change <laughs> would have to be state reps in California in order to, uh, you know, represent the population of California the way that state reps in New Hampshire represent this state. And um, it's always funny to be running into, are there any former ambassadors here tonight? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I always enjoy uh, a, a couple things that are kind of unique to New Hampshire is the number of former ambassadors you run into on, on, on an almost daily basis. Um, and then, uh, you know, you, I, having lived in New York for a long time, and, and um, you know, my wife and I are moving out to California now, um, politics, state politics, everything is just kind of done on a different, different scale there. And, you know, there, there are a lot of problems in, in other states uh, at the state level um, that I think New Hampshire has, has less of. And I think it says something about New Hampshire that, that one of the, the biggest status symbols here is to have a low numbered license plate. Um, I, you know, I, I don't. I don't think there are a lot of states in the country where people would be uh, jumping over each other to, to 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 have a low number of license plate. But I think keeping those kinds of traditions alive is important, and New Hampshire uh, has done a really good job with that. Um, and so, fundamentally, I, I ask the question in my book: you know, is New Hampshire a good way of starting the process of picking presidents in earnest? And and was it was it ever? And I think my answer, uh, as a bit of a spoiler alert, is that. Um, it's probably the, the worst possible way of, of beginning the process of picking presidents in earnest, except for every other way possible. Um, and it's a bit of a, a Churchillian um, outlook on the whole thing. And, you know, it's the, the other states that complain that it's not democratic and it's not fair, uh, and that New Hampshire has this privileged status that, that Arizona and uh, uh, Oregon do not get is is a valid criticism, and you know, and, and I'm sure a lot of you have have, t have talked to Secretary Gardner about this, and you know, I think the the, the defense is basically that um, the the alternatives being first of all a national primary system where everyone shows up on the same day and casts their ballots at the same time sounds good in theory, democratic. If you think the there's a problem with money and politics now. Just just wait until we have that system. I mean, granted, you know, Donald Trump, sort of a celebrity candidate who did not campaign the the quote unquote New Hampshire way, was able to win the primary this time around. Uh, but going forward, the little guy would have no shot whatsoever uh, if that were the case. Um, and I think New Hampshire, even when it doesn't reward the the little guy, it still gives the little guy a chance. And I think that's important. And I, frankly, we saw that on the Democratic side with Bernie Sanders. I don't think that race would have ever developed into the close contest um, that it did. And, and I don't think, um, you know, sort of the, the energy on the left would have been able to coalesce to the, to the, to the extent that it did um, without Bernie having a chance to compete in a state like New Hampshire, because if he had been a national primary, it would have been over um, immediately. And I think the, the, you know, the other kind of proposal that people bring up a lot is a, a regional primary system where you break up the country into different um, different regions. 
And that's maybe a little bit better, but again, you still have the same problem of scale. I mean, it's, it's going to be impossible to campaign on the ground in, in a region of the country. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the idea of having a rotating system where, where one state um, goes first one year and another state goes first the next, again, it sounds good in theory um, and probably is more fair to the rest of the country, frankly. Um, but, you know, there's a reason why New Hampshire's been first for, for 100 years now. And it's really hard to um, just, you know, instantaneously um, shift that kind of level of civic engagement that you get here to another state. And I think anyone that's covered, you know, a Nevada caucus um, and has seen what that looks like compared to New Hampshire primary knows fully well um, that, that that is the reality. You know, that people just don't engage as early uh, elsewhere as they do here. Um, but ha having said all that, you know, I think everyone in this room should be cognizant, uh, and, and I know most of you are, um, you know, if you want to continue to protect the primary going forward, um, I, I think there are 2020 going into the next election, um, you know, there's going to be some of the biggest challenges that, that New Hampshire has ever had, um, particularly on the Democratic side, frankly, um, because, you know, the, the Democratic Party, um, in their primary process, you know, it, they have a very diverse electorate, and so it gets really hard um, for for people to to here to justify, you know, a state that's 93, 94 percent white to continue to have that level uh, of influence in, in the Democratic race. So I think, you know, as 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 as, as Secretary Gardner and, and and everyone else in this room knows, um, New Hampshire has come under challenges to its status every four years without fail. Uh, for, for, for quite some time now. Um, and it's always come out on top. Um, it's always maintained its status, but uh, you know, I think Billy will agree, um, that is no guarantee that it's gonna stay that way. Um, you know, whether or not there's a state law here. And I think that it's, you know, it's really important for, for, um, for New Hampshire that everyone here kind of comes together and, and comes up with a kind of a strategy and a, and a game plan for how to how to continue um, to defend uh, to defend the primary. Um, so, even though this book is not uh, intended in any way to be a comprehensive, you know, academic textbook style uh, history of the primary, as I said, I did spend a lot of time interviewing people that have been around here for uh, and covering races and involved in races for. A lot longer than I have. So, in every other chapter in the book, uh, starting with um, some of the earliest campaigns and then starting in earnest in 1972, I kind of relate one or two anecdotes that I found uh, particularly enlightening, revealing, or just flat out amusing. So, I thought it, before we open up to QA, which um, I want to have a lot of time for because I think it's the most interesting part um, of events like these, having sat through. <laughs> again, a lot of them, um, and hearing a lot of people ramble on for a very long time. Um, I, I, I don't like readings very much, but uh, if you'll indulge me in this um, very short story from my book from the, the 1972 campaign, I don't think we have Steve, Steve Dupree here, I didn't see him, so um, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, the, the most formidable opponent President Richard Nixon faced in the 1972 Republican primary campaign in New Hampshire was Paul Newman. One of the film industry's most bankable stars, Newman was at the time basking in the afterglow of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid when he decided to get involved in the race. <coughs> in doing so, the Hollywood A-lister placed his bet on a decidedly C-list White House contender. Newman endorsed California Congressman Pete McCloskey, a liberal, anti-war Republican who was running a no-chance primary campaign against the then popular incumbent president. Steve Dupree was an 18-year-old college freshman who had been bestowed the important sounding title of Carroll County Chairman for McCloskey's slapdash New Hampshire campaign. The entirety of Carroll County, which hugs the main border just below New Hampshire's most northerly region, Coas County, boasted fewer than 20,000 residents at the time. But the position seemed like a great opportunity with kid, for a kid with no experience who wanted to jump into politics at the highest level. As it turned out, the gig turned into an even bigger deal than Dupree thought it would be when he was informed that he would be assigned to drive Paul Newman around the state for a three-day post-endorsement sojourn. How did one prepare to show for a movie star around rural New Hampshire? 
maybe some of you have heard Steve tell, tell this story before, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, Dupree asked around and discovered that Newman had a particular fondness for St. Pauli Girl beer. On the day of his New Hampshire arrival, the 18-year-old Carroll County chairman for Pete McCloskey's presidential campaign greeted Paul Newman at the airport with a case of the German Pilsner in tow. After exchanging introductions and getting in the car together to head to the first event, Newman got right to the point. Got a beer? He asked. A very proud Dupree handed Newman an ice-cold bottle of his favorite brew. Got an opener? And at those three words, the teenager's heart sank. <laughs> no was all he could muster. Newman shrugged. Don't worry, he said. I carry one with me. <laughs> Not really sure why he asked him for one, then. Um, as they drove around Carroll County together, two real-life outlaws fighting the good fight for a lost cause, one German Pilsner at a time, Newman began to take a liking to the kid. The highlight of the trip came at a one-runway village airport rally in North Conway, where the prominent actor drew a crowd of about 1,000 people, previously unheard of number for a political event in one of the most sparsely populated enclaves of the state, where Hollywood and Washington were more or less equally exotic concepts. The problem for McCloskey, however, was that almost all of them were, were there to see the movie star rather than the congressman. McCloskey never posed even a slight threat to Nixon, who ended up beating him by 48 points on, on primary day. Dupree, however, was one of the few participants to get something of lasting value out of McCloskey's presidential bid. Shortly after their St. Pauli girl-fueled road trip came to its completion, the actor managed to track down his former road companion's dorm address at the ultra-liberal New College in Sarasota, Florida, and sent him a photograph signed with the following note. To Steve Dupree, the best date I ever had. <laughs> Dupree, who went on to become a close advisor to John McCain, and a Republican National Committeeman representing New Hampshire, couldn't get the photograph up on his dorm room wall quickly enough. It was a chick magnet, he recalls. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I, I love the stories like that um, that are in the book. I mean, that frankly, that was my favorite thing to write. Um, and so I think it's a good example, too, of you know an 18-year-old who had no political experience that gets to be a county chairman for a presidential campaign. So I know, you know, we have a lot of students here today, and I would really urge you to take advantage of the unique position you're in in New Hampshire um, to get involved in a campaign at the grassroots level because uh, you probably might not, you won't meet a movie star, maybe, uh, but uh, you'll really get to be um, involved in politics in a way that almost no one else at that age can. And uh, there's, there's just no substitute for that kind of experience, as some of the operatives in the room can tell you. Um, and you, you'll be doing more than just stuffing envelopes, you know? I mean, campaigns are really fueled by young people. Um, they're, they're the engines of the thing. And as I said, when I covered my first one in 2008, coming up here, I was 24 when it started. And no idea what I was doing. No idea. And I was uh, covering a campaign for CBS News, and standing in front of um, all people that want to be president of the United States and getting to ask them questions. And uh, New Hampshire really is the one place, along with Iowa, that offers you that opportunity. Uh, so it's, it's a great one, and I hope, um, you know, I hope we can keep this thing going for, uh, for another 100 years, uh, because you know, I think um, the state has, has earned its reputation. Um, so I'll be happy to, to take some questions. Thanks. Never, in presidential campaigns, you never hand the microphone to someone in the audience, so I'm glad we have this set up here, because you never know when they're going to give it back to you. I have learned some things. We learned that lesson the hard way uh, back in 2016 also. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming out and speaking to us. Um, how, has, how have the different regions of the state uh, presented different challenges? Because you know the different parts of the state are so different from each other, it, it almost yeah. seems like it's creating a multi-state uh, primary system, even though they'd be really small. Yeah, I mean, I love, personally, I mean, it's great to hang out around here in Manchester, and this is where, you know, I always end up spending most of my time. Um, 
but I always love to get up to the to the hinterlands, frankly, um, get up to the North Country. And there's a there, you know there's a long chapter about um, some time I spent um, way up uh, in the Dixville Notch and and and, and around Berlin too. Um, <laughs> you see how I pronounced that correctly? I want to make sure I get credit for that. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, I mean I think uh, it's not. It's not as much of a challenge as it might be in other states because New Hampshire, you know, even even though there are very unique um, areas of the state, and, and I appreciate that um, geographic diversity, it's still a small state. So you, you know, you can you can get from from here to Keene in, in, in a couple hours. Um, so that makes it a little bit a little bit easier. Um, but what I was glad to see, and this might not answer your question directly, but I was glad to see this time around, um, you know, the level of student involvement and in whether it's UNH or Keene State or any of the other colleges here, I found in my three campaigns is really dependent on uh, on w which candidates are running. Um, you know, in '68, uh, McCarthy really was able to harness that that student vote, and I think Bernie did an extremely effective job at it this time around. And so um, it's nice to see uh, it's it's nice to see those college towns um, really become active spots. And I, they always have been to a degree, um, but it's nice to see them getting more attention um, than they had in the past, maybe. Um, and, and But I think the other part about it is um, now more than ever um, in the different regions of the state, you know, there's still great newspapers here um, but but you know as we all know they've, they've their their influence I think has declined a lot um, the, the local papers and uh, you know it's it's it used to be that um, you know someone writing in in, in Berlin uh, would 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 be able to keep people you know in that town informed about what was going on but they just don't have the staff and resources and money for the most part to do it so um, it, I think now more than ever it's important for the candidates to show up face to face and. And I know, like John McCain, you know, who I think is sort of, in a lot of ways, kind of the hero of the New Hampshire primary. Um, I think if, if John McCain could have it his way, he'd be campaigning here right now, <laughs> probably for the rest of his life. He loves it so much. But he told me for the book that he he loves, can, you know, he loves getting out of the population centers and getting out to the different parts of the state. So I think <laughs> if McCain, um, if someone who who won the New Hampshire primary twice, um, thinks that's important, that other candidates should too. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, timely book, timely book and catchy title. Uh, oh, thank you. On that. Um, I've uh, lived here 43 years, and I go back to U grade and Georgie e. Hiphop. Of course, George H. W. Bush campaign been involved in every contested primary campaign ever since. Uh, and notice in that time, New Hampshire has been consistently the fastest growing state, except for Florida, um, <coughs> in the east of the Rockies. Uh, and uh, it, and it's a very wired state, and yeah. one if not the most affluent state. Doing, depending yeah. on what metric you use, um, and uh, you know very high tech. And I'm kind of wondering whether you address that. That there might have been cultural changes in yeah. the state associated with that that might have led to the Trump phenomenon and uh, other factors that influenced uh, possibly other. Uh, primary right. Well, you know more about, a lot more about this than than I do, I'm sure. But but clearly, you know, the political makeup of the state has changed pretty dramatically over the last couple of decades. You know, having gone from um, a state that, in general elections, was was once typically pretty pretty consistently more Republican to to, to really shifting um, pretty dramatically. You know, more. I can't think of. Um, you know, there there are other states that have made that shift, but I think New Hampshire is is, is kind of you know at the forefront of, of that, um, and I think you know you're seeing um, a difference in the way that Massachusetts exiles have have fled Massachusetts, and you know as a lot of people know, um, in the towns along the border, um, and have turned those into kind of uh, a different kind of Republican hotspot. As far as as far as how all the the things that you talked about being a high tech state and being a, a wealthier state, as far as how, how that affected um, how, how Trump might have taken advantage of that, I don't know. I mean, to me, Trump was such a national candidate that 
Um, in this case, I think New Hampshire was just kind of distilling the national mood, frankly, more than anything. I mean, he, he's such a unique candidate. He, had, by virtue of The Apprentice, really, he had been in people's living rooms for, for 10 years leading up to the primary. So, you know, all of the, the, the rules that everyone here likes to say that you, you need to do when you're campaigning in New Hampshire, uh, you know, look people in the eye three times and, and, and go to these small events. Trump didn't do that. But I think he was able to, to win because he's a uniquely positioned candidate um, who, who has been in people's living rooms for, for so long. So I'm not sure that there's something about the makeup um, of the state in the way that's changed that necessarily helped Trump. Um, I think it was more that New Hampshire was just at the forefront of, of what was simmering nationally. That's my view of it. And there were so many other candidates in the race, the mainstream candidates putting up. The yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, I just had a question on, do you think New Hampshire ever will lose its first uh, in the nation primary status? And if so, what kind of primary would that look like, as New Hampshire not be the first one? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, um, I think it's, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, the Secretary of State is always on guard um, <laughs> uh, 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 to try to prevent. And, uh, you know, he's done He's got a hundred percent record so far, <laughs> um, so. But I do think that the challenges are going to be at least as stark as they've ever been heading into 2020, as I said earlier. So, what will replace it if it if it ever does change? I don't know because there's so many different entities involved in, in this. You know, you have the DNC, you have the RNC, you have the state parties, you have the national parties, you have the you have the state governments, you have legislatures from from other states. You have the candidates. Um, and I think, frankly, uh, one of the things that uh, helps keep New Hampshire first is that, you know, we've already had Martin O'Malley was here the other day. Um, I know uh, Governor Kasich is going to be here later this week. We got uh, Vice President Biden's coming up. So what tends to happen is the candidates, or the prospective candidates, start showing up here. And um, they become allies of New Hampshire, you know, because Number one, they, they find that they like campaigning here and they, they agree with the, 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 the process. And number two, um, frankly, you know, once they start campaigning up here, they're not going to say, uh, well, no, I think we should get rid of this thing, you know, because they, they want to ingratiate themselves to voters here. So there are a lot of, um, besides the law, and, and it, there are a, a lot of elements to this that I think um, the inertia moves it to, to the point where uh, it's more likely than not to to stay, so I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't try to predict what would ever replace it. I think. Um, I think New Hampshire is going to more, more likely than not. I think it'll stay first. Scott, how are hey, you? I'm doing well. Good to see you. It's great having you here. And uh, before I ask my question, I just want to say, and we're here to listen to you tonight, but. Buy his book if you haven't. Oh, if you have nice. mine just on Friday. It's really, it's a great read. And I appreciate that. Through it, so. But if I were ever running, I'd hire you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you just, you just mentioned an interesting point about allies, and um, you know, your experience having been here as a reporter and uh, having the experience of really kind of getting into the nitty gritty of New Hampshire. Um, we talk about the future of the primary, and, and one of the important facets that I think is media that come here every four years or even in between the, the cycles uh, experience New Hampshire and then you know we, have, we go through their filters to the rest of the world about what they think about the New Hampshire primary so yeah folks like Jonathan Martin and Dan yeah. Balsman have been very supportive yeah. I'm curious to get your take on without naming names maybe but what's the media's perception generally about the primary their experience here and uh, I think that's an important thing for us to look forward to yeah I mean I think it's um when you talk about the media, I, I, I mean, to me, it's not a monolith because you just mentioned a couple of reporters who spend a lot of time on the ground, which is, I think is what reporters should do. Um, and they're great reporters. And um, those, those reporters like me that have spent a lot of time here um, are almost universally <laughs> supportive, I think, you know, of, of the primary. Um, the problem, I mean, I've been, and I have to say, particularly in cable news, is that um, you know we've moved more and more to a model of people sitting around a table and yammering to each other, <laughs> and I don't know how much those people care about the primary, you know. So I think um, hopefully 
a lot of those reporters that you just mentioned uh, and people that have spent time here, you know, they, they do go on, you know, Jonathan Martin's on every show, you know, once a week it seems like he's, he's on something. So hopefully the influence of people that have spent time on the ground here um, will hold sway over maybe some of the Beltway press that doesn't really appreciate it or get it. Um, you know, and I know that there are some, like I remember with, when Joe was here, um, you did uh, a, a piece with, with Rachel Maddow who, um, you know, whatever you think of, uh, of Rachel Maddow's politics, she's a big supporter of the New Hampshire primary. Um, so I think those kind of like smart analysts like her, frankly, that are, are political junkies that really are into the process, like the, they're allies for the primary too. Well, just to that point, I think for all of us up here in New Hampshire, for, for us the primary is bipartisan, nonpartisan, Republicans and Democrats, we find little common ground often, we do find it on that. And so yeah. you know, we're grateful for her support as well. Yeah, I mean, look, look every, again, every reporter I know uh, loves New Hampshire. Uh, you know, my wife Jo spent eight months of her life living in a, in a Hampton Inn in, <laughs> in Bedford because she loved it so much. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's really, you know, it's unlike anything, up, anything else. You know, I, I write something in the book about, you know, and I have memories from, from covering Mitt in 2008, frankly, um, and they're kind of blurry at this point, but um, really, I don't even remember because I didn't understand the geography of the state as well back then because you're on a plane and you're flying in and you go wherever the van takes you. But I just remember, you know, a couple of events in particular that kind of took place at nighttime and just around Christmas and, you know, you, you roll up to the White Steeple Church with the, uh, the candles and the windows and it just feels like a very powerful and, um, and unique thing. And, and we haven't lost that, you know, in spite of the way that Trump won, I think. No one, no, one, no one in the future is going to be able to campaign the way that he did, so I don't think we're going to lose, lose that completely. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. As a, as a reporter, <coughs> how does covering the New Hampshire primary differ from covering the later ones where it's yeah. almost all decided? It's so much more fun covering New Hampshire. It really is. Uh, and frankly, Iowa, too. This is one where it's um, similar because just when you're covering the candidates, um, they're just a lot more, everything is less scripted earlier on. You know, here you have candidates showing up at chili cook-offs and showing up at pubs and diners and they're just talking to people. And you can get right up in their face as, you, you know, as voters here and know. Um, and anything can happen. <laughs> and you don't get that later on uh, in the primaries because it just becomes more and more scripted. They just deliver their st stump speech to a big crowd and they, they leave and that's it. Obviously, there's a lot of interesting reporting and great reporting that goes on further and further into the, the, the cycle, but the more interesting on the ground reporting is definitely in, the, in New Hampshire and Iowa because that's just, there's much more can happen that's unexpected. Um, I'd say that's that's the biggest difference, and I know people that have been involved in the primary for a long time will tell you that, um, and just in, in campaigns in general, that we we have lost a lot of that even in New Hampshire because you know the, the candidates because of the way the media is frankly now um, anything they say <laughs> can be used against them in, in five seconds now, um, so they're much more uh, tight-lipped uh, about um, doing things on the fly. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but I have to say, you know, maybe this is um, a, a, a positive thing that came out of Trump as well. Someone that, <laughs> again, no matter what you think of him, kind of just said whatever he wanted to say, whatever he said it. And, and what happens is people, when you have a candidate like that, and John McCain in 2000 is a, you know, a, a, another good example of that. They say a hundred things, and you know, one of them, two of them might be a gaffe, but you kind of move on because they've said, 98 other things and you don't really know what to latch on to and I think that actually I think Trump kind of stumbled into that style of campaigning it's just his personality um, but it's actually effective and and people this is an, an age we live in where people value authenticity more than any other quality I think in a candidate and if you can't fake authenticity you know, and I and I think um, you know you, you can you can think of candidates who, who weren't authentic and they suffered for it. Um, so I, I think hopefully going into 2020, what the lesson that candidates will take from Trump here is to be themselves and from Bernie, frankly, to be themselves and to not worry so much about what they're what they're um, 
what their uh, what their strategists are telling them to say. <laughs> well, I did live in Iowa five years before coming here. Oh, and I will wow. say the caucus system is something that's very odd. I think. It's very odd. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they say in Iowa they pick corn. No. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, yeah. Two questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first is uh, New Hampshire, among all of the other things that were pointed out, is also uh, one of the grayest and most rapidly graying states in the country. Yeah. And so w um, what would be your charge to middle-aged people like myself uh, and, and students who are, uh, who are sort of wanting to be engaged and thinking about their future? You know, what's your charge to them to to keep this alive? And is that a, a duty that um, they should, I mean, aside from Bill Gardner never dying, which I think you kind of should have named this book, Bill Gardner Must Not Die. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what's our responsibility to uh, ensure that this stays first? I mean, it's, it's yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think- Water, I don't ask bad ones. Okay, well, <laughs> well if, you, if you asked to first, I would, I've learned from politicians, and so I was only gonna answer whichever one that I wanted to answer the most. <laughs> um, but I think the most important thing is to, for young people to realize in New Hampshire that care about preserving the primary is that it might seem to you like this is a guaranteed thing, and it's codified in state law, and it's been here forever, but it's really not, you know. There, there are a lot of things that could happen that could upend the thing. So I think just not having that sense of complacency. And if you want, again, if you want to be in politics or media, um, you know, for me as a young reporter, if that interests anyone, there's nothing better than coming up to New Hampshire and covering the primary. Um, you have to be uh, active and engaged um, on social media and come out to events, you know, and and. Spread the spread the word about why 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 this is important, um, and just don't don't be complacent. I guess is the biggest the biggest thing that I would say. Yeah, because it's really, I mean, there, every time there's been a challenge, you know, it's a real challenge, and it has to be. There's no uh, there's no automatic default that that necessitates that this is always going to be in place. Um, because every time there's there's been a challenge, there's been a, there's been a different kind of solution um, and a different kind of pushback to that unique challenge. Um, and so that will be the case, I think, going forward, too. And when you are here, um, spending a lot of time, especially the New Hampshire-based embeds and the campaign-based embeds, do you find that um, earlier in the process, you, um, I don't want to say are you more forgiving toward the candidates, but do you find that you know, maybe the, the, the meetings on the ground with them are less harsh, and is there more trust with the candidates than the pundits sitting around the table. You mean among among reporters that are co that are covering them? Yeah. Um. That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, reporters that I, what I find is reporters. Everyone can disagree with this, but like, they're, on the ground reporters in New Hampshire aren't necessarily looking for the gaff. They're looking for something that's. Um, new and different and interesting. And if you're covering the same event, especially as an embed, you're covering the same thing 500 times and hearing the same stump speech 500 times. And then the, and then the candidate you know, goes out of his way to attack another candidate for the first time, let's say. Then that's obviously everyone is going to write about that. Everyone's going to talk about that. So I think that's where like the lack of trust comes in, because that's probably really annoying to the candidates. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I don't know if there's a, there's a greater degree of trust. I think. What happens is they slip up and they come into it thinking that they got this and that they're like you know the governor of a state or a senator and they know how to how to how to campaign and they've won races before and this is going to be easy and then they show up and it's not that and um, you know the national press can be especially tough um, you know they uh, they all, oftentimes then the reaction is to is to you know go into their shell um, so I don't know. There, there probably is more trust at the beginning, and then they take uh, the candidates tend to take a bad lesson from that when that trust is broken. So I don't know what the solution to that is. You stop me anymore. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Social media is transforming campaign politics because the news is instant. I'm just wondering, from your perspective as a reporter. You know, what do you see happening in the future with that? Um, yeah, I mean, what, I think what's interesting about New Hampshire is that 
a couple people I interviewed for the book mentioned this, and it's very true, that winning in New Hampshire before, you know, in the old days, um, it, was, it was social media before there was social media, because the idea is that you, you show up at, and, and this still exists outside of social media, social media, um, you show up at an event and there's 20 people there, but you, do, you give a great speech and you shake every hand and you make those 20 people respond to you, and they tell their 20 friends that, you know, hey, this candidate's pretty good, and they, they tell their 20 friends, and that's, so that, that's, that's kind of social media dynamic before there was social media has always existed here. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just gonna continue to be more important um, outside, uh, uh, you know, kind of the mainstream outlets, the conversations people have. You know, I think, like, if you talk to some college students here, we don't, we, f we don't even realize, like, the, we can't even, no one can wrap their minds around how people are getting their information now. I mean, there's just so many different sources from, um, from, from, you know, Twitter, Facebook comments, Snapchat, um, CNN, to just, emails to text messages it, like there it, it's impossible I think it's impossible to really wrap your mind around that and candidates that um, do the best job at identifying how important social media really has become and especially as you know the young people of today get older and become um, become to dominate the, the, the electorate which is already happening I think Millennials are the biggest share of the electorate now which is kind of amazing um, that the candidates that figure that out are going to thrive. And again, to bring it back to Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, you know, um, say what you want about Donald Trump's tweets, but <laughs> it was an effective tool for him, really, in the end. Um, and that's a way to have that kind of direct and formal contact with people, even when you're not um, doing the, the old school uh, meetup at the Red Diner or what have you. Um, and then someone like Bernie was just really just surrounded, like you would go to a Bernie event and there would be a hundred volunteers that were college age or just a little bit older than that. And so they just get it. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm almost 34 now and I'm old to them. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, I don't fully understand how, how, um, how, how all that's distilled. But if you, if you, the candidates that surround themselves with, with more young people here will continue to thrive, I think. Do you see that change in your role as a reporter, reporters generally, because you're competing with direct communication? Yeah. If things are happening, you may not be there. I mean, what I found over the last few years during the rise of all this is that one good thing about it for reporting is that it's taken it. So now the things that are prized the most are the really quick nuggets and the really quick scoops, but also the really in depth deeply reported magazine style pieces that take weeks or months to do. And so what's been kind of almost eliminated is the in-between, where it's like the day of kind of story where you kind of wrap the events that happened in the last 24 hours, which used to be the bread and butter of, of political reporting. Um, and I think that's not such a bad thing because I think oftentimes those middle ground stories are the least interesting and the, they give you, they're kind of the most vapid in a lot of ways. Um, Whereas, you know, the, the, the deeply reported stories I found, thankfully, in 2016 were the ones that often got the most play and the most traction. So um, there is an investment in that that's going on, uh, thankfully, in a lot, of, uh, a lot of major news outlets, and now more than ever in investigative reporting as well. So that's, that's one positive element to take away from, from all of this, which is a lot to handle, I know. <laughs> Thanks. So you mentioned earlier how it is possible that we may lose the first elimination primary. What states do you say, see that have a similar primary process to us and could conceivably take up that mantle as well as we do it here? I mean, there aren't, there aren't any. I mean, it, the, the closest thing that comes to, the closest state to New Hampshire as far as the, the level of engagement in the process is Iowa. Um, but as far as a primary state, it, it would be South Carolina. Um, I think there is a lot of engagement there, but um, but, but it's not the same. I mean, South Carolina is a bigger state. 
there are major media, several major media markets in South Carolina. So to win there, you really have to have more of a media strategy um, than you do in New Hampshire. You have to have more money. So there's no, no, there's not one state that's waiting in the wings that would sort of like take, you know, that would be the, the obvious go-to to, to replace this. It's more a question of um, the, 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 the two major political parties um, deciding that they're going to try to upend the, the process. And then I, my, my guess was, would be that they would create some sort of either a regional, they would try to create either a regional primary system or, or a rotating system. Um, there, there's not one state, I think, that's kind of waiting in the wings. Since the other microphone got a lot of use, I'll use this one. Um, in an earlier response, you mentioned the candidates' reporters' relations, the candidates' relationships with the embeds. Uh, what do you find is the attitude of the embeds themselves? Are they excited to do this? Are they dreading to follow one candidate for months at a time? Do they learn a lot? Do they any sort of all of those things? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, but they're mostly excited. Yeah, I mean. Um, Again, I, I was an embed for CBS News in 2008 and um, learned more in that year than I could have probably in five years doing a lot of other kinds of reporting. So um, yeah, you, it's, it's exciting and it's, uh, it is unlike anything that you've ever done before um, and it is quite a learning experience. Um, and uh, it, it's also deeply, frustrating at times and uh, you become um, very easily uh, put off by <laughs> by uh, having to hear the same speech a hundred times and you know you kind of develop this um, um, sort of uh, this, this, this like underarching kind of um, deep-seated ill will towards the candidates sometimes, uh, even, even the ones that you like, because you're just sick of hearing them say the same thing over and over again. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love, for me, I love the experience, and, and Joe, my wife, who was a, a New Hampshire-based embed, um, did too. Um, so it's, and, and I know the campaigns have a, have a difficult relationship at, time, at, at, at times with the embeds, and part of the reason is because they're so young and inexperienced when they start. Um, but if anyone is, is, is thinking about you know, trying to do that at some point, I would, I would very much recommend it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I created a TV show called Embeds, which I think was in Tyler's uh, announcement. Um, and you can watch it on uh, Go90. Yeah. It's not a documentary. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, everyone. It was a pleasure to be here.